So before we get into sort of the controversial side of Freud, let's talk about where we left off. So we left off with this idea of the personality dynamic of Freudian theory. So let me help you out with the first possible test question today that you'll hear of several. This is where the neo-Freudians sided with Freud. They agreed with him on personality theory. They thought that there was some logic to this. So they are called neo-Freudians, people like Adler and Carl Jung, um, because they bought into the personality theory, right? Where they deviate from Freud is because they tended to believe that Freud put way too much emphasis on psychosexual development, right? From gender identity standpoint and even from an actual like sexual intercourse standpoint, right? So let's talk about the personality theory first and then we'll get into kind of the theory of, of, of the Oedipus complex and the stages of, of development and how this leads into things like penis envy and some of the more controversial Freudian um, topics. Um, so the dynamic of the personality, according to Freud, it's actually it's got some genius to it. So again, these are things that the other psychoanalytic theorists did buy into, they did pres prescribe to. So the idea is this, Freud is not explaining anything that medical science today doesn't confirm. The difference is, is that he personified it, right? He gave it, he gave, let's say characters. So one of the first confusions I wanna clear up right off the bat is that Freud did not believe that you had three conflicting parts to your personality. It wasn't like an equal trinity of personalities that you had. He believed that you were a personality, the ego, the self that is I, right? Ego is I. But he believed that the self, the executive, had to decide when to listen to your instinctive drives and when to listen to your morals. So one word that I think you could definitely put down, or write down, when it comes to Freudian theory or psychodynamic theory is this idea of conflict. Conflict is a buzzword on a test, and here's what I mean by that. The Freudian concept, well, let me say this. The psychodynamic concept of conflict is based on the idea of unconscious forces competing for behavior. So they may be deep-rooted psychological problems from childhood. They may be um, aggressive urges that are, that are inappropriate. They may be, right, any number of competing forces for your attention. So with Freud, everything is the... Is the border between chaos and, 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 and civilization, right? So you have like, you know, this, this idea of like um, life versus death, death, the life instinct, which is eros, and this life preserving and reproduction and, you know, um, all things that are allegorical, like flowers representing wombs and things that, like that's self-preservation. The fact that you may have an instinct to try to harm yourself, but the eros life instinct would prevent you from doing it. Like, um, self-preservation. So you have Eros versus Thanatos, and Thanatos is the death instinct. And, and basically Freud explained, as we talked about on Tuesday, the death instinct is this idea that for the circle of animalistic life to work, one being has to die to feed the other. And so there is a intrinsic drive for death. It's not necessarily destructive. It's not death for the purpose of destruction. It's death for the purpose of nutrients, right? Nutrition, I should say. So but the reason why it's important that we point that out is because this is the beginning of understanding why things can go wrong. If there's a life instinct and a death instinct, but your life progresses in a functional way, everything stays in balance, right? Order and chaos, life and death, um, good and evil. But if something goes wrong and there's trauma, then those instincts do exist. So Freud is probably, it's fairly deep when you think about it this way. And again, to be fair, it's hindsight bias. It is. But Freud is explaining a concept that he notices in his patients, right? So the death instinct becomes problematic, what he calls displacement. It becomes displaced violence or anger or aggression. It becomes problematic when your psychological trauma means that instead of the aggressive urge to do something that benefits your life, you might be conflicted and now that aggressive urge becomes destructive. And maybe you're jaded and you, and you carry a lot of anger and you might become destructive about society, or you might become destructive towards other things, right? So displace, displacement explains why there's bullies, or 
when you see little kids harming animals, why is that a red flag? Well, that aggressive urge, which is normal, is manifesting itself in a destructive way instead of a constructive way, right? So you can make the argument, according to Freud, that death for the purpose of preserving life, as counterintuitive as it sounds, is constructive. But death for the purpose of destruction is not. Obviously, that's, that's, that's a bastardization of, of the purpose of aggression. If aggression is a, is a biological urge, an id desire, right? So it's a, that's the first thing that's important to understand. The ego is who you are, according to Freud. It is your essence, right? That is, the, that is the personality that is you. What the ego is tasked with, what it does, is it spends its day trying to determine when do we listen to the id and when do we listen to the super ego. Now let me help you out with some more test questions here. Because this can be confusing, right? And I probably should have done a better job in the past, right, of explaining this. But let's... let's and maybe this is not fair, but for the, for the purpose of explaining it so it makes sense, let's give modern day neurological titles to these aspects of you. What if the id is nothing more than your limbic system, right? Nothing more than your homeostatic desires. It's genetic, it's hormonal, it fluctuates, right? Um, and that's a fair way to look at it. So these id desires by themselves are not problematic, right? And if you're in an animal kingdom of, of desire and action and desire and action and desire and action, instinct and action. We talked about like the lion killing the gazelle. That's just a part of the chain of, of being in existence. The issue comes in when we get into the superego. The superego is learned. It's not a part of your biology. You might argue that there are universal truths and there may be, maybe things that people just recognize as being bad because of mirror neurons. Like you harm someone else, whether on purpose or not, and you feel empathy for them. It's a theory of mine. So, yeah, you can make that case. But for the standpoint of this discussion, let's say this is your learned sense of right and wrong. This is your constructed ethic, your morals. So here's where it comes in handy on the test. If they are giving you this scenario where someone knows the right thing to do, but yet they still don't do it, it's not a lack of super ego, right? Because you'll get questions like that. It'll be something like, Sally has the desire to cheat on a vocab quiz. And she knows it's the wrong thing to do, but she can't help herself. Well, they're telling you in the question, she knows it's the wrong thing to do. That's worth noting. A lack of superego would imply that no one ever taught her that that was wrong. So Sally's lack of self-control is not a lack of morals. It's very literally a lack of self-control. So if this is your learned ethic of right and wrong, which is subjective, right? In some cultures, it's not wrong to kill people under whatever circumstances, or it's not wrong to steal if you're staying alive. So it could be situational. Maybe we take the super ego out of it. Maybe you have this desire to steal food because you are hungry, and that's a reality, and you could steal the food and stay alive. And maybe you're not morally conflicted by that in that situation. So no psychological stress, no anger, no anxiety, no guilt. There's no conflict here. So back to that Freudian word. The conflict arises when the ego has to decide between two competing motivators. So if the ego is who you are, these are just motivators. The it is motivating your behavior based on the desire for, for pleasure. Instant gratification. Is that bad? No, right? Experiencing pleasure in your life is a very beneficial thing. But if all you do is seek id gratification, then you're missing out on the ethic that makes a functional life. And here's what Freud would say. If you never learn right from wrong, okay, you're an animal. But he calls this the price of civilization. This is the curse of man, right? Why do we feel anxiety and stress and depression? Because sometimes we're confronted with the fact that we made a decision out of impulse or whatever, and after the fact, it conflicted with what we thought was the right thing to do. And now you have psychological stress. So in this way, Freudian theory is fairly deep. And the, the neo-Freudians and the other psychoanalysts, they bought into this. They agreed with this idea that you have an ethic and it motivates your, your, your decisions. But you also have drives and they motivate your decision equally, if not more. Now let's bring it home. What if, since the id we're calling our limbic system, what if the ego is your prefrontal cortex? Maybe that's not a fair argument, but what if it's the, the part of your brain that controls your impulses? Let's call it your 
Executive Decision Making Center. I like that metaphor because now it's, it, it lets you off the hook a little bit. It's not like you lack morals when you make an impulsive decision. So here's, here's a hint for the test question. If someone knows something is wrong, but they give in to a desire anyway, it's a weak ego. And this is something that a lot of people don't think about, and they tend to get this wrong. And I understand why. The goal of a balanced person in Freudian theory is to have an ego that is stronger than your urges. That's the goal. You want to have a disproportionately strong ego. And you say, well, doesn't that make me egotistical? Well, no. That would be narcissism if you're only concerned about yourself. Because think about this. Narcissism is not the same thing as being egocentric. Because if you're narcissistic, you're only seeking what feels right in that moment all the time. Which means you lack an ethic. You lack a moral. Right? So if you lack this idea that that's the wrong thing to do. Like, so, for instance, if you had some test question that asked you about how Freud would analyze a sociopath. Well, lack of morals. Right? They don't feel morally conflicted about what they're doing. In other words, the moral is not there. But if they ask you a question about some teenager who knows it's wrong to cheat on the quiz, but does it anyway and then feels guilty, it's not a lack of morals. It's a lack of ego. It is a weak ego. So definitely put that down. Just kind of understand the goal is to have a strong ego because you want to be able to make the executive decision in spite of what your urges are. And this is an important part of Freudian theory. The urges are not problematic by themselves. The urges are not like, and, and this is important for our society too because this is where Freud kind of gets pretty close to home. What if for id drives, we're talking about aggressive instincts and sexual drives? Well, sexuality is a, is a controversial thing in our, t in our society, even in 2020. So if we repress sexual thoughts and drives and we don't talk about sexual fantasies and we don't talk about sexual thoughts and we just pretend that people don't have those, it doesn't make those drives go away. No, it means that you're stuck ruminating on them by yourself. Maybe you even repress them. What if you grow up in an environment where sex is taboo and now all of a sudden that you feel guilty for your sexual feelings and you repress those thinking they are, they're troubling. Well, Freud would say the problem with that is your morality is overriding natural biology so that you feel guilty without even participating in an action. You see how that works? You feel guilty for your thoughts. You feel guilty for your feelings, and that's problematic. So when you're repressing your feelings and that makes you feel guilty, that's gonna cause psychological distress. And that's when you get things like reaction formation and you get things like projection. And we'll talk about various defense mechanisms in, in, in just a second, right? Did that answer your question? Or did you? Yeah. And that ha you see that happen. You see very repressed sexual, uh, either sections of our society or, or various cultures that are more sexually uh, open than other ones. And the idea here is that the id by itself is not bad, but there is an appropriate time for the ego to give in to those id urges. And maybe it's not that sexuality is bad, but you may not be in a space in your life where you're ready to get into that. So you have the desires and you don't want to commit to them. You don't want to make the decision, but the desires are still there and the thoughts are there. And so then you get the psychological conflict, right? So again, the stress only comes from conflict between the superego and the id, right? If you, I, this is, this is a really shallow analogy, but imagine like the id is the devil on your shoulder. I don't even want to call it that. Like it's like your urges are evil, but Imagine that in the sense of like instant gratification, regardless of the consequences. So if the id is the devil on your shoulder and the superego is the angel, you're still you, right? And what happens if you only do the right thing all the time? Well, the devil's going to get anxious, right? The, the id is still there. You repress and suppress whatever you want to. It's, it's not going to go away, right? So trying to suppress your sexual thoughts doesn't make them disappear, right? It just, it just leads to things like defense mechanisms, right? So... The it operates in the pleasure principle, right? It's not just that you have an instinctive drive because here's the reality, back to the conflict. If your instinctive drive is to eat, homeostatic, and you have access to food, wherein lies the conflict? There's not one. The conflict only happens when what you desire to do conflicts with the right thing to do at that moment. So going to get Chick-fil-A is, is, not, is not a bad thing skipping fifth period to go get Chick-fil-A because you can't wait any longer, that's an ego decision that you made. You listen to the id urge instead of listening to the moral superego urge. 
right? So this is just personified characters of decision making. But don't get it mixed up. The, the ego is who you are. That's the executive reality principle that's making the decision. What's motivating the decisions are either your urges or your morals, right? So they're not equal. So the it operates on the pleasure principle. If not, that should say by. If not constrained by reality, by the ego, it seeks immediate gratification all the time. And that's why people who just do what they want to do are never happy. We know that is dopamine. It's like the reward prediction error, right? But if you're always seeking instant gratification, you're always going to be seeking. That's the problem of this whole idea of like, well, I don't want to be responsible. I just want to do what's fun all the time. Well, that's, that's kind of problematic because you have enough of a moral, enough of an ethic to know that by doing what I want to do all the time, I'm actually shirking responsibility. That's why little kids are not conflicted. They don't feel morally conflicted about doing what they want to do. They haven't established the moral yet. Yes? So is it and dopamine like relative to this Yeah, I would say they are because, because calling it dopamine is not, is, not a bad, is not a bad way to look at it because if dopamine is the desire to get, that's what the id is, right? So yeah, that's not a bad way to look at it. If, if the id drive is your dopamine reward pathway, then your brain still has to decide, well, that looks really fun, and I can make that a reality, or maybe I need to do the responsible thing and ignore <coughs> my drive, right? What would the pathway for, like, I used the pathway for like, what would the pathway for us? The pathway for what? Like yours should be uh, I, I think that's more knowledge-based. That's more like your understanding. Because again, and I like that, because the idea of a superego implies that you feel guilt sometimes. And if you feel guilt, that means that you're conflicted inside. It's not like Kohlberg where he says, well, kids only do the right thing because they don't want to get in trouble. Well, that's not guilt. That's, that's consequence. If you feel guilty because you cheat on a test, that means you had some standard of ethic that you shouldn't have cheated on the test. And you got to learn that at some point. So that's more like knowledge, like cerebral cortex. So if this is like your knowledge of the world, and again, that's where you're different than animals. And, and children, for that matter. It's not a lack of intelligence. It's children don't possess the ethic to know what they're doing is wrong. They have to learn that through consequences. So child, you know, steals candy from their friend in second grade, and they get caught, and they're scolded, and they're like, listen, you can't steal candy. And if they, well, why not? Well, because it's against the rules. Well, then they're just learning consequences. It's a conventional morality. But if you teach them, like, how do you think that made her feel when she had candy and you stole it? Oh. Now we're developing theory of mind. So now that's, we go from, I don't want to get caught, into, well, this is the right thing to do. And that's how you develop an ethic, a, a morality. Yes. Correct. So if, you want, if Freud were to analyze psychopathy or sociopathy, it would be a lack of superego, a lack of moral standards. The collective superego, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Let's call it the social contract, right? There's at least a basic level of things that we've all agreed we're not going to do. Or if we do them, there are going to be consequences. So, like, we've all agreed that we're not going to steal each other's stuff. And if we do, there's consequences. So, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. The collective superego. And it might be different in, say, one culture versus another one. Or even one situation. Like, killing is bad. Unless someone's trying to kill you in combat. Now, you still are conflicted about it emotionally because of theory of mind, but you're not, all of a sudden you're not concerned about the consequence of the action. It's just whether or not it emotionally affects you. Do you have a question? Did that answer it? That would be the Freudian explanation, or the psychoanalytic, let's say, because other the neo-Freudians agree. So the psychoanalytic therapist would diagnose, like the example of the psychopath, as lacking morals. Now, it's a little short-sighted because they didn't understand that they may actually lack a theory of mind. They may actually have stunted development in their brain that prevents them from having empathy. But without brain scans, there was no way for them to know that. That's why if you committed these acts, these immoral acts, back in Freud's day, they just locked you up in an asylum. And then 
give it a couple decades and they just start lobotomizing people, right? The whole idea of your decision making is flawed because you're a psychopath. So we're just going to take like this giant ice pick and just jam it up into your frontal lobe and you'll just sit there and drool on the floor. So that's, that was their approach, which luckily now you have this medical idea, the medical model of like, well, this person is, has a psychological disorder. So rather than locking them from society, we need to treat them, right? And so if, if there's someone who, who, who lacks the ability to empathize, well, they might just have to consciously learn how to empathize. Maybe they won't emotionally empathize, but they have to learn cues, right? And you could hopefully teach them that. So is there a way, like, Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they would have to be taught. Correct. Right way. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, and that's a good way you put it. If they don't know that what they're doing is a bad behavior, how could they be conflicted about it? Right. And that's where you're right. This 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 concept of the superego is very conscious. Right. It's it's not an unconscious thing. You you consciously know. Well, my mom said this is bad. I shouldn't do it. Right. That's the superego. And that's where it becomes easy if you learn the dynamic of, the, uh, of the, the personality, it becomes easy on test questions because now all you have to do is diagnose this. Is the moral there? Yes. Okay, well if that person knows it's wrong and yet they did it anyway, it's a weak ego. And somebody in another class asked, well why isn't it too strong of an id? Okay, and that's a good question that you didn't ask, so I'm gonna answer it. The idea of having a hyperactive Instinctive drive would be the exception, not the norm. So we're assuming that most people have the same level of sexual drive, the same level of fluctuating aggression, the same level of rage. So if they wanted you to know the answer was a hyperactive id, they're gonna have to tell you that in the question. They're gonna have to tell you that this person is incredibly impulsive because they have stronger urges than everybody else, right? Otherwise it's unfair because the point here is the ego is what's making the decisions, right? So if you, because even an animal has to make the decision to pursue the gazelle, right? So you might say, well, their id desire is strong. And that's where I like his idea of dopamine. Even if I feel the urge laying in my cave to go kill a gazelle, if I'm not motivated to get up and go chase the gazelle, it's never gonna happen. So behaviors are the decision to go do. Right, so that's why you might think it's problematic for your significant other to be thinking about other people, but it's not problematic on the same level for them to act on it, right? Thoughts and feelings are one thing, and they can be problematic, but behaviors are an entirely different thing, right? They just are, and we kind of understand that. So, from what I understand, it is typically unconscious, right? Yes. So, think it, implicit, if, if the I is implicit drives instead of instinctive drives. Is it fair to say there, someone if someone has it as a hyperactive, it's not uh, something that kind of can change that. Probably not. Like let's say for instance, yeah, they just had they were really aggressive, like hyperactive amygdala, more testosterone than everybody else. Okay, I'm I'm glad you said that. That that gave me a thought. So there are defense mechanisms that the ego uses. I like that. So I'm going to use that as my segue. The purpose for defense mechanisms, according to Freud is to combat psychological stress. So let's say, to his point, somebody is hyper-aggressive, because that's a real thing, that's an aggressive, there's a disorder that, that you have more rage than other people, for whatever reason. Maybe it's nurture, maybe it's nature, maybe, who knows. But if you have a hyperactive id drive to be aggressive, and it's destructive, Freud would say the ego feels the need to combat the stress that you feel by using defense mechanisms. So to answer the question easily, yeah, it's unconscious. Is there anything we can do about hyperactive id? Kind of, because Freud would suggest if you sublimate, that's the word, a sublimation, like sublime. If you know that you have hyperactive urges and you channel those aggressive urges into socially acceptable activities, yay, right? So instead of like tearing the wings off of butterflies, you're gonna go for a run. When you're aggressive, instead of like screaming at the person who cut you off and flicking them off, you're gonna like go home and, I don't know, go for a jog. Instead of punching a tree, 
right? So sublimation is the way to deal in a healthy way with aggressive drives, even sexual drives. So the opposite of that, just before we move on, because this is a good segue, the opposite of sublimation, the sublimation being the healthy way to deal with your id drives, is displacement. And that's a literal term. You're going to take the, the placement of your aggression, whether it's sexual or violent, and you're going to put it on someone that's not a deserving target. So bullying is a good example of displaced anger, right? Why, why is he beating up little Timmy? Well, it's not because little Timmy tried to stab him with a knife and he's defending himself. No, he's got displaced anger. He's got rage inside of him, and how that anger is manifesting itself is displaced onto Timmy. Timmy is the un deserving target, we'll say. And that's what displacement is. And that's how Freud would explain things like sexual assault. It wasn't intended as a consequence. It's displaced sexual aggression. It's very problematic, right? So, and, 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 and it's kind of confirmed because you see these things like people who have complexes with women and they feel the need to dominate them, even strangers. That's psychological pent-up rage that needs to be sublimated, probably with therapy and, and other techniques, maybe even medication. But instead, how does this pent-up rage manifest itself? It manifests itself as displaced anger, right? So that's how you look at these, these, these defense mechanisms, is the ego is trying to find ways to deal with things that, that it's faced with, that are problematic. So if you did have a hyperactive id, that's going to have to manifest itself in a healthy way, sublimation, or in an unhealthy way, which is displacement, which again might make you feel guilty, and you're going to need more defense mechanisms to feel better about what you just did. Cougar's super ego kind of compensating for that hyper. Like, could, could you create a, a hyper super Like you, oh, like, like you. Like kind of balance out. So, like, you have yeah. a, an overcompensation of all as well as. If you like started studying Eastern, you know, philosophy and, and, and yeah, but that, I would ar I would argue that even though it doesn't seem like an action, that would be a form of sublimation, because if you if you consciously know I'm in a bad place, I have an anger problem, I need to fix it, and you start going to like meetings, well that's a form of sublimation. You're taking your pent up aggressive urges and you're trying to because to your point, you're consciously trying to channel it instead of unconsciously allowing it to come out. Because think about this, not that anybody would do this, right? What happens in a lot of romantic relationships with displacement? It's not that you come home and beat up your significant other. No, 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 You come home and emotionally dump everything bad that has happened to you on them. That's displacement. So you're not mad at them, you're mad about something else. So you get this knockdown, drag out marital fight over not taking out the trash. It's not really about the trash, bro. It's not about the trash. That is displaced, pin-up aggression that has a source somewhere else. And how you combat that if you're on the receiving end, you recognize it for what it is and be like, listen, there's clearly something you're upset about here. What is the source of this anger that you're giving me? Because if it's something that I did, I need to know about that so I can make it right. And what you're really saying without saying is, if it wasn't me, leave me alone. But that's the polite way to say it. If there's something I did, please let me know. Which is your way of saying, hey man, chill. Right, but if you say chill, they're gonna like swing at you. So don't say that. It's bad. <laughs> okay. But yes, that's that's a form of displacement. It doesn't have to be physical aggression, it could be emotional aggression. So what happens when you come home and you take all of the stress from your day and just displace it at your significant other? Well, that's unhealthy. And after a while, all of your interactions are negative. And then it becomes reciprocal determination. You come home and you're stressed out and you unload on your significant other, and well, how do they respond? Well, if you're gonna go on the offensive, I'm gonna go on the defensive. And now both of us have our hands up. Let's see who wins. I meant that metaphorically. But I think you picked up on that, but I don't mean literally fight it out. But that's what happens. And then everybody's like, well, we can't get along anymore. Well, it's not that you can't. Freud is saying you are displaced. You are making the ego decision to channel aggression in a place that doesn't deserve it, the wrong target. Maybe not even blaming them for the problems consciously, but maybe like having the emotional demeanor from the from the the stress. So so having the stress from all other problems and bringing all the problems. Yeah. To, you know, one, like you said, the trash, it, yeah. 
And that's, that's a good way to look at it. That's when it becomes displacement because all of these things that we're fighting about are not really about this, it's displaced. Now, let me be clear. It doesn't mean that you hide your emotions so that you don't ever like make your significant other uncomfortable, right? I'm not going to that extreme. You, you should be able to discuss with them the source of your stress, but that's very different than you coming home and unloading on them like they were the one that caused the stress. You see the difference there, right? Question, the, yes. Say that, say the last part again. I caught the first part. Modern psychologists. I was just to say. Yeah, this is fairly, this is fairly prevalent. They may not use the psychoanalytic words now and say, but yes, displacement is very much now even in developmental psychology. Because when you look at kids who have like anger issues, well, it's really hard to explain that a kid has an anger issue without really pointing to Freud. Because you're like, okay, well, what do you mean he has an anger issue? Well, he's, he's, He's destroying things around the house, okay? Why is that problematic? Well, because that's not a healthy way to deal with your anger. Oh, so yes, even if they don't use the psychoanalytic terms, the idea of displacement and, and projection and reaction is still very valid in therapy now. So it's almost like altering the coping mechanism with stress. That's so, a good word. Rather than coming from the dump, like, uh, I'm Venting. Then, yes, mm -hmm. okay. Just yes, and I like your word coping mechanism. The idea when, okay, so and, and let me explain the difference. That's phenomenal. There's, venting is, is something that you need to do sometimes. It's, it's, it's sublimation. But here's how you do that. With whatever way, whether you verbally say it or you imply it, you have to somehow establish the precedent or set the tone for the discussion that I'm not blaming for you for what's about to happen. Right, does that make sense? So when you go, come home, you don't come home and just start firing double barrels. You come home and create this conversation, and then there's going to be a problem. Oh, how was your day? Oh, my day was horrible. You've already established in this discussion that it wasn't horrible because of you. If I'm at work and my wife is at work and we go home and start yelling at each other, we're not really yelling at each other for something that either of us has done. Or maybe it is. Maybe it's something I did before work, and she hasn't gotten a chance to yell at me yet. Okay. <laughs> But there's still a healthy way to go about that discussion. So I like the distinguishment there. Venting is not an unhealthy thing, right? But you have to establish that in the, in the context of the discussion that, look, I'm going to vent here. This is not me blaming you for my problems. And sometimes you, even literally just stating that goes a long way. Like, I know this is not your fault. I just got to get this off my chest. That goes a long way because it brings people's demeanor back down away from being defensive, right? Notice the terminology, defense mechanisms. Because if someone attacks you, your natural tendency is to defend. And now it's not a conversation of how can I help you or how can I support you. It's a conversation of what did I do wrong and what's my next piece of ammunition I'm going to use. And now it's just going to escalate. And that's a problem. Again, watch toxic relationships. You'll get more details on that. Right? So I like everything that's being said. The superego is conscious. It is, can be a way to sublimate. right? And that's the key, understanding sublimation healthy. Good, sublime, we feel well. Right? What if I have this pent up stress about college decision and I just can't feel okay and I can't sleep at night and it's really bothering me and I know I'm gonna feel better but I need time to pass and I need to be two months from right now. You need yoga and meditation is what you need. You need some time. You need something that will help you sublimate that, that aggressive urge that you have. Pent up psychic energy is what Freud calls it. Right? You have, you have psychic energies in the form of positive emotions, positive being above homeostasis, negative being below. You have positive stress right now, maybe about getting home, sent home for COVID, and that's real, and you can't just will that away because then you're repressing it, right? <laughs> ignoring it, all right? Starving the beast, right, doesn't mean ignoring that it's in the room, right? It means that you take the beast on head on. So knowing that you're stressed, you need to consciously make a choice to sublimate that. I had a good discussion with someone earlier today about that. This idea of like, they wanted advice on how do I get into a good place right now. I'm just not in a good place and I know it. And part of that was, was deeper than that. But some of the essence of what we talked about was this idea that you need to consciously make a choice to sublimate some of this extra energy that you have. And it, and it might be, what's in my control? If there are things in your control, if you're stressed about whatever, whether it's college, COVID, whatever, 
If you're stressed about something that you can handle, then handle it. Do it. And if you can't do it because you, have, you don't have enough time, then get off of Snapchat for four hours so that you can get it done and you'll feel better. But if it's not something that you can control, you need to learn to make your peace with that. And believe it or not, that may not be psychological. That might actually be a physical action that you have to partake in. Because if sympathetic nervous arousal gets you keyed up for a fight, the only way to eliminate energy is by burning it. So you might have to do something that's healthy. You might have to sublimate this aggressive urges, right? So that's something you need to be able, you need to hear that, right? You're sitting in your anxiety. You need to be running through your anxiety. Right? If you don't have energy, you don't have pent up energy. Right? You need to sublimate that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you talk about sublimation. Are like sports and you know, they have like, things where people can like, you know, get out aggression physically? Yeah. Is that a good coping mechanism for distress? Like, is mm -hmm. that something you should? Well, some people say no because it's like, like there was this movement for a while where these companies would like, buy houses that were condemned and they would let people come in and just destroy stuff with hammers and now it's become a business like you make this room where you can just go destroy stuff and some psychologists are like well that's really aggressive we're teaching people to be destructive but here's the definition of sublimation as long as what you're doing is socially acceptable it's good and, and again so here's why I like what you're saying there have been psychological studies about whether or not collision sports are good or bad for teenagers not just from brain trauma, but even things like aggressive urges. So in other words, there's two sides to this coin. One hypothesis points to evidence that says aggressive sports make people aggressive. Another hypothesis says the opposite. Aggressive people turn to sports as a sublimation for their aggression. And, and I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I will just point to, to, to what I've seen. And we know observation is not evidence. But in, in an impoverished environment that I was in prior to this one, in the absence of sublimation for aggression, there was much displaced aggression, right? And that's just all I'm gonna say. I don't think that's a scientific finding. But people who didn't have healthy outlets for their aggression, that aggression still manifested itself. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be sports, but there does need to be a sublimated outlet. And sports are a good way to do it because not only, it's, it's controlled aggression, it's not chaos, you have to learn to play within the rules of the game. You have to collaborate with your teammates. There are rules against unnecessary aggression. And so you can't just be the craziest person out there, right? And, and that's who wins. So we're, it's not a dominance aggression. It's a controlled aggression. Mm -hmm. So do you think that, like, with the implementation of rules in, within the sport, gives them, like, a sort of unconscious realization of, okay, there's rules for the sport, mm -hmm. and then they go in society, oh, there's rules for yeah. society. That's astute. Because what's beautiful about anything that you have to learn as a kid, whether it's like, oh, okay, well, if we're going to let you color, we can let you be a free expressionist and color all over the page. But when we give you one that has lines, you want to control yourself and color inside the lines. What are you doing but creating boundaries? And you're right, we're not thwarting creativity because we still have an outlet for creativity, but, but we're setting an expectation. And yes, that's what sports do. And that's what organizations do. Even if it's like boys and girls clubs or, whether, or, or like the optimist club, is you've created an organization of people it's interactive, it's social, it's collaborative, but there's a structure here. So you can't just come in here and be the craziest person here and, and win because now we've allowed it. And, and that, to your point, is going back to the, is it destructive to just let people go crazy until they're out of energy? Maybe, I don't know. And that's where like, are we gonna let you go in a padded room and knock yourself silly? That's probably dysfunctional because all you're training a kid to do is physically harm themselves when they have too much and some people do. They slap themselves in the head or slam their head on the ground. If you ever get a test question about, you know, some Neanderthal athlete that bangs his head on his helmet, well, that's displacement, ladies and gentlemen. That's not sublimation, right? And again, why is it not displacement for him to pummel a smaller athlete on the field? Because both of them signed up for that. That's the difference. It's not bullying to watch an MMA fight. It may not be your thing. I get it. It's kind of barbaric. But... Both of them signed up and volunteered and trained for that very possibility. They're not being attacked in the streets. That's displacement. An organized MMA fight that has rules and both people understand and there's no competitive disadvantage, that's sublimation. Now, and again, the argument is, well, if people fight in the octagon, they're gonna fight in the streets. That doesn't seem to be the case. 
you just don't see MMA fighters attacking people in the streets. You just don't see that, right? Excuse me, is Ryan, Ryan in Paddington class? Yes. Can you come to the same services for a second? Yes, it's funny, we were talking about that yesterday, pronunciation. So, I like this, if you like this metaphor better, what, what if the ego is the, is the like center of the scale, and what if it has to decide when to listen to the id and the superego, right? When we talk about the defense mechanisms, right? Let's get into the, and the defense mechanisms make more sense after you understand the dynamics of this. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of give you, and I don't mean to make light of this phraseology at all. I'm being very serious when I say this. There's a little bit of a trigger warning here that there are some things, they're not sexually explicit, but they are, they are, they are difficult to hear. But this is the, the essence of Freud's studies of what he saw. Right? So again, I know that this, this is going to cause some reaction. So um, it's not explicit in nature, but it is, but it is hard to hear. But I, I will give you some context. And this is where we've given him plenty of leeway. Now we're going we're gonna to filter in some critique. Say, okay, some criticism. So let me just give you some backstory as we get into these, these stages. The idea behind the psychosexual stages is this. Freud believed that you developed your your ego identity as you progressed and interacted. And gender roles were very much at the heart of that. And that's where Freud might be a little short-sighted. In fact, the Neo-Freudians kind of rejected how much emphasis Freud put on childhood conflicts. So I'll give you an example. I don't know if there's a good <laughs> mnemonic device to remember the order of these. I don't know. But like Erickson, here's how I remember them. I just think about the developmental task. So Freud's development is called psychosexual, meaning that it's how does the mind develop a sexual identity as one progresses. So it's the idea that you learn same-sex role expectations from your parent, your same-sex parent, and you learn romantic role expectations from your opposite sex parent. And there's something to that. So when you get into the phallic stage, three to six years old, you have children who are imitating their same-sex parent and Freud noticed that they were competing for the attention of their opposite sex parent. Now, it's not openly, consciously sexual in nature, because we would be implying that a six-year-old has an actual sex drive to, to have intercourse with his or her opposite sex parent. And that's not so much what it is. But Freud is very literally implying that that subconscious desire does exist, and they don't realize it because they don't understand sexuality yet. Right? So... Mm, but I'll just explain it for what it is, and I'll try to be as fair as possible and not, not, not lean you one way or another. But basically in the first two stages of development, much like Piaget, and again, that chart is posted where you can see the overlap of Piaget, Erickson, and Freud. Much like Piaget, the first few months of your life are basically oral gratification. It's pacifiers, that calms them down. Breastfeeding, that calms them down. And so, he, let me give you just like a primer on Freud's stages. He, what he called an erogenous zone, a place of built-up psychic energy. So the erogenous zone is the actual physical location on the body where the psychic energy is concentrated. So in the first 18 months of life, the baby's like desire for pleasure is oral. That's why they stop crying when there's a pacifier. And the reason for that obviously would be feeding, breastfeeding. But the anal stage becomes all about potty training. Because again, and there's some overlap to Erickson here, why do, why do small children have, have a problem with autonomy? Because they now have become aware that there are things they can't control. And not only that, they're being chastised for having accidents. So now mom's mad at me for something I've been doing my whole life. That's what Freud is saying. So the anal phase is not so much like when he says in a Rogers in his zone, that's where that task has to be overcome. And if it's not overcome, it develops some kind of complex later on in life, what he calls a fixation. So an example of an oral fixation would be if you don't satisfy the oral urges in your infancy, you're going to like bite your nails or smoke when you get stressed out. It's like a regression back to a previous state. All right, so we'll, we'll pick this up. It's hard to hang that on a weekend, but we'll pick this up on Monday.